And we're live. What time is it, Toby, around the world? Is it so that we're live? Here we go. Redirect to YouTube. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> the magic is happening. Mm. And we're live. Yeah, I, f- I think I forgot to send out the message this morning, but it's 10.30 a.m. West Coast, 1.30 p.m. East Coast. How are you, fellas? What's happening? You're back. Refreshed. Welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah. Miss, I missed you guys. Missed all I was 10. camping. He said with a derisive tone. Uh, it was good. We. Uh, <laughs> it's relaxing out there. Was I derisive? Nah, I was joking. Okay. I still um, don't know what that word means. Okay. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds provocative, though. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what it means, but it sounds provocative. It gets the people it's going. It's provocative. Camping was good. Lots of fresh air and a uh, little bit of nature and overindulging on s'mores, all the good stuff. Mm. I like s'mores. That part of <laughs> camping I would definitely take. <laughs> I was going to say you can eat the s'mores at home, too. You yeah, have to go and do all that other stuff. It's not the yeah, same. Right. They don't taste as good. It's close. That s'mores pop tart. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What you about see you, they baby? make it for you. Exactly. I'm, you know, I've had better, better days, Toby. Uh, I'm in the process of a move. Your mid move. I've got a dispute with a landlord. Uh, uh, I've got no cable. I'm at my grandma's. Shout out to the curtains behind me. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, there's there's just a lot of shit going on that uh, could be going a little smoother in my life, and yeah. I'm going back to Chicago in a, in like a week. So there's a lot of stuff. Kids are ending school. I'm gonna have to be around them again. Got some stress. <laughs> your grandma drink. ironed the curtains, but you forgot to iron your face this morning. <laughs> Did I? Wait, I? Yeah, I'm a mess. I'm I'm a mess. I. But you know what? This is an audio production first. That's right. And YouTube right. is just kind of like there. That's right. So your voice is still very sultry, so it's all good. Thank yeah, the, you. The, you took the mic. That's the most important part. Yeah, I thought so. And I'm not like on the computer. But if I get pixelized and whatnot, I'm a fair warning to everybody. We'll just fill in. Yeah. So what's it feels what's, what's, a little bit like April, except the difference is now we're at all time highs. <laughs> And back then we were not. That was February. We were, yeah, we were crashing. But this is the whole setup. I thought about going in the closet because <laughs> that's proximity to the router. So what's your what's your topic today, JT? What are you doing? Uh, you know, I went hard on electrical engineering last time, and uh, to to a mixed review apparently <laughs> from the ten. <laughs> Some people liked it, and others uh, not as much. At a and we're happy to point out all the uh, potential errors that I said. So I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going the other direction this time. We're going pretty soft. And uh, I've got this a term from Buddhism that we're going to crack into and see how it can help us and, and maybe others. So Ooh. we're keeping it. We're, we got a lot of range on this show. I like, I like that. it. What about you, BB? And what are you doing? Just real quick, by range, you mean that you went one way, everybody corrected you. So now you're going a different way that we think we'll get closer to correct. Yes. No, I mean, uh, I just talk about whatever I'm interested in at that, like in the last 15 hours. And that's like basically it. how it- <laughs> since you woke up this morning, since I woke up this morning, that's what we're going to talk about. I like it. I'm going to talk about Markel and my experience around a group of humans. It was l- glorious. Is that the first time you've been around humans? Humans. Uh- <laughs> In the last uh, 12 months or so? Uh, no, uh, I live in He's Florida. He's in Florida. <laughs> yeah, oh, so uh, yeah. we haven't really believed in COVID for a while, but um, I, I would say that it was the first time around a gathering of humans. I had, yeah, a, fun, I had a fun dinner uh, on Sunday night. I caught up with Chris Bloomstrand, Moses Kagan, and Alex Rubel Carver. It was kind of cool. It's just, it's, I've, I've had a couple of, that's like the third time I've caught up with other human beings who are outside my family. So it was fun. Yeah. I, I, I'm no longer like laughing maniacally the whole way through because I, uh, so excited to see people the first two times. So I've got myself back under control, which means that I'm unlikely to be committed to a psych ward anytime soon. 
but uh, my, a lot of my awkward top, hugging. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to know what you do because I'm a, I'm a bit of a hugger. I, I don't I don't mind a, I don't mind a big hug. I hug Tom Hand Gainer. him out. Tom said that really? I could hug him. Yeah. Well, I asked permission. Well, I didn't Patience really zero. ask. I said, uh, I was said, it I'm from sp- the front or the back? <laughs> typhoid, typhoid, that would Bill. Be super weird. Super weird. <laughs> I came up and hugged him from the back. No, he was, he was cool with it. I told him, I was like, I'm so happy to be here in public. I could hug you. And he was like, you can hug me, man. So then we hugged. It was nice. Ah, what a legend. Yeah. So Good then stuff. I bought like all my, my entire portfolio is Markel. That's due diligence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the deep, deep dive. Well, they got a little bit of it's. It's they got a little bit of you got diversification through them, right? It's like it's like uh, Charlie and his three three companies, but his three companies are like Berkshire, you know, which is yeah, pretty diversified. Costco and Lilu's fun. Yeah, I, it bothers me when Charlie says that, but what, he has enough uh, goodwill built up that he can lie a little, and I won't be upset. Um, my topic is going to be, wait, I want to get back to this, this dinner. Did you, uh, did you guys drink red wine? We did. When yeah, Bloom's Bloom's Strand, Strand, he wine. knows wine, doesn't he? Yeah. So that was, he, he selected a couple. Um, yeah. I, they were, they were, might've been at more at the growthy end of the spectrum of value, but, uh, that they went the, the deep value that I'm usually used to. Wasn't yeah, no, he's, he, yeah, he's a Garpy wine, wine buyer. You couldn't sure. twist the lid off these ones. You had to, you had to pull them out with a corkscrew. There's a whole ceremony at the table. It was great. Yeah. You swish it around. Did you yeah. do that? You got to do that. Mm. Yeah. Make it look Perfect. like you know what you're doing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about the small cap, uh, small cap run. Is it going to continue on? I found some research from these guys called Bridge, not Bridge Water, uh, Bridge Way. Uh, very cunning. Never heard of them before, but uh, they've they've said some stuff that that uh, confirms my prize. So I'll, yeah, I'll be talking perfect. about it. Let's get. That's into- how I choose it. <laughs> do you guys remember when we used to be able to make the Naga not going to work here joke anymore? Oh, you let it do that yeah. anymore. No, you can't say that. That sucks. That was fun. I feel bad that I offended that dude. Yeah, simpler times. <laughs> yeah, they were. I mean, I guess the notoriety is nice, but some of the freewheeling spirit has had to go. Yes. No. Oh, well. Don't, don't let it die, Bill. Keep it. I think I'm pretty good at offending people, so let's keep it ro- rolling. Well, anytime you're talking on the internet, you're going to offend somebody, so you can't worry That's about fair. that too much. So, I, but, I'm, I'm, but there's, no, there's no malice. You know, as, as uh, old mate says, no mercy, no malice. That's, that's the way to go. Um, Is I'm your do, old I'm, mate Scott Galloway now yeah. that you've pasted your head on his body? Yep. Yeah, that's right. I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mate, he's got that nice bicep, uh, you know, bicep vein that we're all trying to get without doing anything. He looked better with a Ben Graham tattoo on him. I'm just saying. He looked better with my hair on him too. That too. Oh. That helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Full head of hair. All right, let's let's do let's let's jump into this. So put everybody out of their misery. Yeah. So everybody knows, small cap value has had this terrible run until recently, and it started running. So the question that I get a lot from everybody is, you know. This has been a very violent run up as this eliminated all the discount. Do you think this is going to still keep on going on? So um, Bridgeway has taken a look at it. They've used price to book. It's imperfect, but but whatever. That's that's what they've chosen to do. It's still an interesting analysis. Um, so they, they say that the uh, most of the run has been in the size factor, which is an observation that I have made too. That uh, So it's more size than value initially for the small cap stuff because it did impact it, the run was in the smalls rather than in value, uh, but small value was a beneficiary of that run too. So they say, based on our analysis of relative book to market valuations through the end of March, prices of small value stocks would have to rise another 43% relative to the broader US market to get back to median historical levels. How much so did that- April and May already do that? Well, it hasn't done much. I think it's been it's been really? a little bit flattish through the last... Huh, okay. There was a there was a there was a squirt through you know from like Q end of beginning of Q four last year end of Q three until yeah. really the end of Q one which is March thirty one and then I think it's been a little bit flatter recently. Um, Ran out of juice. <laughs> yeah, it seems to have a little bit like I I I get a little bit nervous when I see all of the the big techie stocks falling over the way they have because I I don't think it's it's rare that that doesn't bleed over into the rest of the market. It may not, but 
I sort of think that it probably will end up doing that. And then I can't see how the little, the little value stocks survive something like that, but you know, I'm hopeful that they do. Well, it has bled in to the rest of the market. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, we're off the highs. We can still see the highs from here though. How far, what are we off? Yeah. But I mean, it's not as if like big tech can't see the highs. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, Google is all of, I don't know, it's 23, 29. It it topped it at 24, 30. So, see, I think those kind of companies, the fangs are kind of almost value these days. I sort of mean, so what? You're talking like Fastly and shit? I just mean stuff that's in ARC, like basically Ah, ARC. Fuck that stuff. That stuff doesn't matter. Well, there's a lot of money in it. It's yeah. you know, it's heavily traded. It's it's down from like I think it topped out at one fifty six last time I looked. The close was like it was close to a hundred. Yeah, it's like thirty five percent off now. I think somewhere around there. This feels like fear porn to me. Which part? Uh, I I think like the worrying about some of these smaller. I mean, look, it's it's a lot of money. Like so, uh, Palantir. Uh, I, I guess they used to be a eighty billion dollar company. Now they look like they're a forty billion dollar company. Forty billion used to matter. On the other hand, forty billions only what like not a whole lot anymore relative to the total market. So I don't know. A, I guess I would I would now. need to yeah I'd need to like do a aggregation. But it seems to me like um, Post Market said this. Shout out to them uh, that. Uh, you know, like this time sort of was different because all those guys, uh, like a lot of those really growthy names sold off 50% and the market sort of yeah. chugged right through it. Well, that's, that's the sort of the 99, 2000 scenario, wasn't it? When, it, when the dot coms came off a lot, but the rest of the market was okay. But then there was a pretty, there's the tough recession through there too, from 2000 to 2002, when the market did eventually come off itself. So that's sort of what I'm alluding to when I say, I don't see how tech can come off like that. And then not, have that bleed over into the rest of the market. I guess why? Like, why does it have to bleed off? Well, I guess that there are people who are, you know, there are people who have holdings in one thing, sell one thing to buy another thing. That's sort of how it always works, isn't it? You, you, it's there are cross holdings that you just not ne- you can't necessarily see. And when one, I mean, why, why, why do all of these things sell off at the same time? Why do they all sell off as a group? That, that's the thing that never makes any sense to me. Yeah, but I guess what I'm thinking is like while they've been selling off, other things have been catching a bid, right? Like it's almost right. like a rotation thing. So it's, I mean, I don't know. I hate saying that it seems zero, zero sum and especially without data. I'm sure one of our listeners is going to be like, you are so wrong. And you know what? I probably am. I haven't done shit to That's research this opinion. <laughs> so <laughs> you want to research for me. Thank you. But I guess I, I, I guess like that stuff was... Uh, I just don't know that that's what's going to bring us down. And with all the stimulus, I don't know that I see like a recession necessarily coming. I don't know so either. I just think it's a tough. risk. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen either. I just, you know, it's been a long time since we've had a proper, you know, we've, we've had a, we had like a flash crash in March, 2020 last year, but we haven't had a grinding bear market since 2007, 2009. So I just don't know if, you know, not that I really know what I'm going to do in that period either. We so don't have those anymore. Guess, those are, we're done with yeah, those, Toby. We've solved the business cycle somehow. That's great. I didn't know it was that easy. Well, uh, you just kind of push risk elsewhere, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, what if it actually is solved for a while? Like, Would you invest on that basis though? Would you assume that, you know, would you run it red line, leave it up? No, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't lever it, but I, I also would not hold 30% cash banking on a drawdown. Ooh, it's fighting words. That's yeah. exactly I'm not, what I mean, I'm not trying to coming fight. right at me. No, I'm not. That's not <laughs> what I'm trying to do. It's just like, uh, I just think if you're holding cash, you're fighting like a really, really big tidal wave of policy and incentives. And that's really tough. I know that's a lot true. of people that but, have done but it. But it's always the case. Time. It's always the case. But there were people that were 35% cash in 2014 saying, oh, it's not cheap enough. And they have been getting destroyed. Value so like, What? Value guys. Yeah, but like that's, I mean, I don't know. At what point are you just like wrong? I mean, eight years, what's, what's the average person's career? Like 50 years, you're going to take eight and have 35% cash against this bull market? I don't know that you survive that. 
now maybe if you're running your PA, but uh, you know, you also like you're getting relatively less wealthy that whole time too. Yeah. Know. But then when the market comes off, you know, so if, that when the, when the market, co- well, it will eventually. I'm it did saying, in March. Yeah. It, that was a flash crash rather than a, that wasn't a grinding bear market. That wasn't the real thing. I know, but dude, that was a pandemic that the economy stopped in and the market sold off. And you're saying to me, that's not enough. Like, so I guess what I'm saying back to you is I agree that that wasn't like it, it in my world. If you put that much leverage in the system and stop the economy, that's like the perfect recipe to have a crash. And if that wasn't the outcome, then to me, like betting on the outcome coming seems like really, really hard for me to get my head around, even if that's all predicated on N equals one and there was a ton of policy and there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences. But I don't think you even need to know how it's going to happen or what's going to happen. You just have to know that it's within the range of possibilities that it could happen and you should be you should be positioned appropriately in the event that it does. Yeah. I, I don't disagree. I guess we're, we probably would just be talking about like the probability of the event plus the expected downside and whether well, or not you can time that. But, and then, then you look at your opportunity set and look at why you want to be long and like the opportunity yeah. set, you know, market's expensive. There aren't a lot of options around there. You don't want to be, you know, 60, 40 sucks. Everything sucks. There's nothing really where you can stick your money. Maybe, you know, Gold Melt miners up. look cheap. Melt up. I mean, it's entirely possible. That's that's like every single time the markets look like it's going to fall over, we've had a melt up. So melt I'm not, up. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that that's not also in the range of possibilities. That is in the range of possibilities. But we might be long on the melt up thesis, which pains what, what me mean? to say as as the key melt up. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. He's I saying gotta... longer inning than previously. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, it's frustrating to not be in inning two anymore. Uh, but <laughs> you know, with all the I mean, with all the policy response, and even though I do think that a lot of the inflation is probably going to be transitory, it's hard to argue that uh if rates go up, the market it would be tough for the market to melt up while rates go up. That would be a difficult thing for me to fathom. Uh, if rates go up, this whole the whole jig is up, right? On all of this stuff. Rates can't go up, basically. I don't know. Dude, you can't have a three percent earnings yield on the S and P and five percent treasury. <laughs> but you're not going to get a five percent treasury, right? Because the I, I'm just once you, once you get over two percent, uh, you th- get right to ten. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Once you get over two, it goes to fifty. I think the two is kind of the basically they got to blow up the dollar. They just can't let it go above two. Which means probably you want to be in crypto and gold and other stuff like that. I don't think so at all. If if rates go up and it creates some bust, like I don't see how crypto and gold work. That's a deflationary bust. You want cash. Well, I might carry 30% cash then. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I guess as long as you weren't doing it since 2014, uh, which, you know. I, I just, I don't know. I think it's just tough. I think, I think cash, I, I think positioning around beta exposure is very, very, very difficult. Well, well part of the difficulty that yeah. you have too is that, you know, that the, it, with interest rates pinned so low, like ordinarily in any other, basically in any other scenario through the data you can run back, like at the point that the yield on the S&P 500 dip below the, the 10 year on the treasury, like you're probably better served being in the treasury. Also because when the bust comes, the treasury runs up. So, you, 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 you know, that's why 60-40 has worked so well or any sort of tactical move, you know, any sort of equity risk premium, anything like that has worked pretty well as an investor. But now you're in a scenario where, you know, it looks like inflation expectations are exceeding the 10-year and then uh, S&P 500's nosebleed expensive. So, you know, I don't know where you put your money. Like, I like value. Value stuff looks, looks, looks relatively cheap, but not absolutely cheap. But here's the thing about value stuff that I, and I don't, I, again, like I need to, I don't have the data. So sue me if I'm wrong. But uh, if just as a generalization, you're talking in value about companies that are probably on average a little bit more capital intensive, right? Yeah. That's, I think and that's like slower reasonable. growth. If we're talking, if we're talking value, you know, academic value. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
Exactly. If you were talking that, I would agree with that. If you're talking like, you know, just there's, there's a lot of stuff, I think, that high quality value, not necessarily. Yeah, because I guess when I hear value, I think of like slower growing, more capital intensive businesses. And to me, like rates going up would probably be indicative of some sort of inflation. And if inflation came, I would be really worried about value stocks. I, I would be worried about the the discount rate in growth stocks, but the actual underlying cash flows in value stocks more. If that makes well, sense. The problem with the the problem with the asset intensive stuff when you get when it gets really inflationary. Although I heard somebody say something other than this recently, but you know, you remember Buffett's old letter where he talked about the problem is that the cash flows look really great, but then when you go to you know, yeah, you got to replace them. Capex, with higher, yeah, yeah, the capex fucked. is real, yeah. which is not caught very well by the financial statements. Yeah, no doubt. That's what and I'm that's, saying. That's why I'm saying that I think inflation is like a risk to the actual underlying cash flow, like the free cash flow to common equity in those, I think is sort of at risk, whereas the discount rate is more the risk in some of the growthier names that are capital light. I, I think we're seeing a little bit of that now. Um. I don't know. You know, you say inflation's transitory. I, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know either. I don't know, it don't know not, either. I don't really want to bet that it is though. Yeah, but dude, here's the problem that I have saying that it's coming. We're also working through a time when like the entire supply chain was not allowed to go to work. So True. like this is af this is the outcome of shutting the entire world down when consumption doesn't stop. Like there's no fucking inventory anywhere. And it's not just inventory too. Like it was also the shipping got all jacked up for the sewers and, and in other places too. So like, that's why I think it's kind of tough for me. And it's also on the back of like all the tariffs that Trump put on, you know, I mean, like there's now the other part of the argument that I think makes a lot of sense is like, look at COVID. What's that going to do to supply chains? Are things going to be onshored? That's inflationary. So like, I, I don't know. I really don't know. It's, it's way too complicated. And all this macro stuff's way above our pay grade, but it's uh, it's fun to think through and talk about. For sure. Uh, but as JT, look, the other point that I'll make, JT pointed it out, like you can't just, I don't, well, maybe you can, but I don't know. Like maybe it is hard to get everything jump started again, to get all of that stuff coordinated. Like it seems to me like the, 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 the big issue, the bigger issue is that, you know, there are every single business is just one part in a long chain of, uh, events that need to occur in sequence for whatever, you know, consumer product to wind up at your door. And if you mess around with that chain like a, too much, it's like a traffic jam. Yeah. Like this part can't move to this next part because it doesn't have the previous thing behind yeah. it. And it's all in series. And so any break in that series and you, you get a little bit of trouble and the, what, what, what the world has been doing has been optimizing for, for efficiency. And, and now we're, maybe we're going to go in the other direction. Maybe that too is inflationary optimize a bit more for robustness so yeah i mean i don't know all i know is i'm driving a purple minivan with a fucked up paint job because i can't get myself to buy car price the cars yeah. where they are and i know that there's no cars coming because they're all waiting on semiconductors so like i'm just going to drive this thing until it falls apart or i actually lose my manhood which is well, you, pretty much gone you can't you can't get a you can't get a battery anywhere because everybody's had their cars parked in the driveway huh. and haven't started their cars for a year. And so everybody starts their cars, cars don't work. We've had to replace two batteries and there are just no batteries around and they're all stuck on shipping containers somewhere. Mm, get long autos on. Yeah. Price gouging and buybacks. That's like a beautiful Oof. combination. Have a look at the chart on that Buffett side. wet dream. God, sweet, auto sweet zone. buybacks. Is that Eddie Lampert? Who is it that sort of makes all of that happen there? I think that was Eddie Lampert. Yeah. Shout out to you, Eddie. You get a feather in your cap, which is then removed by Sears. Uh, should we do... Uh, who, who wants to go next? Let's keep it fun. Let's go, Markel. Let's, we can... <laughs> okay, well, actually, it's a decent uh, transition. Uh, at the Rabati event, which is somewhere on YouTube, you can find it. Maybe we can throw it in the show notes. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, I don't. I hate doing show notes. Uh, anyway, the um, you can tweet it out from your, your Twitter account. I already did, man. That's kind of uh, why it's go. like with show notes. Sometimes people are like, "Oh, you should have detailed show notes." It's like, well, then you should sort of pay me something to do that because I'm saving you time. But I also get it. I don't know. It's something that I think about. Anyway, I digress. Uh, a lot of the people that were at the Rabati 
um, event. And by a lot, I mean the people that I can recall. So maybe it's just uh, sampling bias or anchoring or whatever the bias is that I'm displaying. They like uh, commodities. And a lot of the reason is like a capital cycle supply chain. Um, a lot of the commodity companies are so sort of um, henpecked is the only word that I can think of. It's not the right usage of it, but they don't want to expand capacity because they've been through 10 years of shit. They've all got religion. They've yeah, all got religion. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And on top of that, you've had some industry structure consolidation. Balance sheets look great. Lots of lots of cash flow. They look good. Yeah. The only problem, man, is I was listening to somebody who's actually pretty smart on a podcast, and he was like, oh, and they're trading at like 15 times earnings, and they used to trade at this. And it's like, yeah, but oh, like one is peak so and one was yeah. nothing, and like, the, the, what are we doing here? Um, so don't pitch a commodity company that way. Uh so anyway, there was that. And then at Markel, the thing that I like about that event is you can really talk to the managers. Uh, at Berkshire, kind of it's big enough that it's hard to find the managers. How big is Markel? How many people showed up to that? It's not that big. I mean, I don't. Uh, six food trucks could serve us all. So, so like mostly kind of value guys, like mostly value managers who are clued into to what Markel is? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think that's true. Some guys that cover insurance and whatnot. Um, but I talked to the guy from Virginia Sprinkler, and I'd say that he said everything that you would want a portfolio company to say about, you know, the. So he, he said that, like, basically they're run exactly how you'd want to, right? Very hands off, very decentralized, send the excess cash to the corporate and, you know, run your own business. And I thought that was super cool. Um, and, you know, Tom, Tom's the man, he's a nice guy. And I was really grateful that he took uh, what I think is actually a risk to say, you know what, we're doing our annual meeting in public. I, I thought that that was a nice, I think that's leadership. I don't think that's the easiest thing in the world to say to people. Rather right than now. doing it over zoom or something like that. Yeah. And like, honestly, fuck zoom. It's time to get back out there. There's enough, you know, like, come on. So anyway, I, I think it was, it's it was sad also, Zoom. yeah, well, <laughs> there's some good parts about it, but like, it, you know, I, I was talking to somebody after and she was like, oh, did you feel safe? It's like, yes, I felt safe. I'm vaccinated. Like, what are you talking about? What are we doing here? Why are people live still in Florida. worried? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. You've already gotten every strain of this thing at this point. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I, I was just, I was, it was really nice to be around people. Um, it was super cool. Bob Rabati had me moderate a panel and like meeting him. That was cool for me. Uh, it was, it was a nice event. I thought they did a good job all around. Domo Arigato. Huh? Mr. Rabati. Mr. Rabati. <laughs> did you hit him with one of those? Everybody must. Yeah. I did not. I don't even know what you're saying right just, now, to be just, honest. Just backwards hugs. <laughs> uh, we didn't do that. Okay. But, um, no, it was nice. I don't. I don't know. I. I think. Um, I think. I guess the other takeaway that I would have is, you know, I got to uh, to hang out with some people from Markel, and then you know we went out to uh, to an ale house, had some adult beverages, and um, felt normal it, again. Huh? Yeah, man. But I, the way the way that the person that I'm thinking of in particular talked about the company. Um, I mean, it was just, it was a nice glimpse into culture that I think that if you're long, you'd be really happy that uh, you saw now, whether or not people like the business, you know, do your own work, figure that out. But as far as the warm and fuzzy stuff about how the business feels, I, I think it, I have always thought it checks the boxes. I continue to think it checks the boxes and perhaps uh, some of it's because of when this occurred, but I, I left feeling quite good about that company. What's the history of Markel? I mean, I don't know the detailed one, right? But I can tell you that it's, it's becoming uh, from a insurance company that then invests in public equities. They're now sort of building out this private company machine where they you know, use the cash flows from the private companies and from the float to invest in further private companies. And, you know, Costa Farms, like I, 
I didn't get a good sense of how big that was before until, you know, they had that, that was this, I'm pretty sure that was the subject of the video. Um, if it's not, then I have horrible, horrible recollection. Um, you know, like that's a big operation. I mean, the amount of plants that they had on conveyor belts and stuff, um, it, it's just kind of good stuff to see. Tom Gaynor was hired in by the family, wasn't he, to, to turn it into a Berkshire Hathaway type vehicle? I don't know that. I don't know that it went down quite that way, um, but that's certainly where it morphed to. Yeah, I think that's what they're trying to do. Yes. And where's the market cap these days? Oof. I think I it was like know. 11 billion last time I looked, but that was late last year. That was, was last year. Say so it's probably double. Uh, yeah, I was going to say 15. Let's see. Ah, 16.8. There we go. All right. Ain't nothing cheap these days. Jeez. No, I'm happy for them. They've been through, uh, that was a rough year. So glad to see them on the other end of it. Um, there's a good write-up in William Green's book on Tom Gaynor too. Yeah. It's worth taking a look at if you're interested in Markel and Tom Gaynor. You got, you got any Markel questions, JT? Uh, no, nothing to add. Do you do you want to do uh, do you want to do? Um... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, last week was was Transformers, and uh, this week is, or two weeks ago, I guess I should say, <clears throat> I came across this term in Buddhism called mudita and m u d i t a, and it's its definition is sympathetic or vicarious joy. And the idea behind it is that, you know, much of our, our world is colored, especially in the finance industry by one greed, envy, jealousy, and then it's, it's cousin schadenfreude and meaning like watching, like celebrating when others blow up. Right. And when others are having a hard time. And I, I think you see that a lot. Uh, and I don't know what it is, what the pettiness comes from. Um, but this idea of Modita is the exact opposite of schadenfreude. So if you see someone doing well, you can be genuinely happy for them. And in a time like today where there are people that to me, it doesn't always make sense why they are having such good results. Um, and they're doing things to me that seem very risky and, and they're very, and they're working quite well for them. Uh, I'm thinking a lot of kind of crypto specifically, maybe in the most recent thing, but there's lots of other things, you know, over the last, well, there's always something happening like that, but um, they, they seem to be more acute right now. Um, and maybe it's just because like anyone can get on Twitter and spout off about it or something. So like you, there's a lot of availability bias in the data set. Whereas if some guy was making, a ton of money in LA real estate in 2006. Like I didn't hear from him, right? Like he's not <laughs> taking victory laps in my brain. Um, so there's something a little bit harder about fighting it now because it's so in your face. And I, you know, I could choose to be annoyed and pissed off and think oh, that person doesn't deserve that. This is bullshit. Right. Um, but what is that? It, one, that doesn't do anything to him, right? Like this is the worst thing. Like Buffett's joke before that, that envy is the worst of the sins because you don't even get anything good out of it, right? There's no fun to be had <laughs> and it doesn't bother the other person. In fact, they may even enjoy the fact that they're <laughs> getting to you, right? So it doesn't help you at all. Um, the other part of it is that I think that there's a, a ton to be said about cultivating from a selfish standpoint, actually, that equanimity, which if you break down the etymology of that word, it means like level mind, um, or even, even, uh, even, uh, I think I wrote it. Oh, spirit. That was the other word I was looking for. So even spirit. Yeah. Is equanimity means even spirit. Yeah. That's great. E even level mind spirit. Like those two, like equanimity put together spirit. Yes. That's, that, that's great. I was I just, for a second there, I was thinking spirit in the sense of spirit level, but my spirit didn't. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Ignore me. Keep going. Yeah. So there's um there's some interesting research by this guy uh Dr. Bezel van der Kolk and he's he's a he's a Harvard clinician who's been he's done work on trauma actually for like four decades and he wrote this book called The Body Keeps Score 
And he goes into, uh, you know, there's obviously when you have acute trauma, like, you know, war, PS, uh, PTSD, or, you know, sexual abuse or physical abuse, um, those are like severe traumas and acute, but he makes the argument that everyone has some trauma. Maybe it's not quite so chronic, but although the numbers are, it, we don't talk about them very much, but like in America, the numbers of actually like of those acute traumas are like way higher than you probably guess. Like one in single digits for most of those um, people, like alcoholic parent, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse. Um, those are all like, or senior, your mother abused. Like all of those are, like more than they're like in the one to one in five to one in eight ratio. So there's a lot of us who have kind of seen some shit in our lives. Um, but what, what, uh, Dr. Uh, Vander Kolk says, and this is where the selfish part comes into it for, for me is that you have to co- sort of deal with this trauma and get it figured out. And he's been spent his whole career trying to figure out how to help these people. And, he has, he's tried like all kinds of different modalities to help, whether it was like meditation, uh, MDMA, um, like micro dosing LSD. Uh, like if you've, if you could imagine how it would help people, like he's tried it to like cure people. And this, this book that he wrote was his findings after doing this for four decades. But um, back to that selfish part, like the side effects, if you don't deal with this trauma are difficulty focusing and and memory problems sensory overload and and inability to filter out what matters and what doesn't matter uh trouble learning new info and changing behavior fear and anxiety around taking risks maintaining motivation and uh and sense of purpose well all of those things if i want to be successful at right. this job like i have to have those things figured out right like i can't suffer from those side effects so even though it sounds like, oh yeah, Jake, you just want to be this like uh, monk who is, you know, equanimous with the, the the rest of the world, and oh, it doesn't bother me when everyone else is making easy money, right? It's not really even about that. It's more about just having your own mind level to where you don't suffer from all this stuff that may take your eye off the pitch that you need to hit. Um, so, I would, I guess, it. In a sense, this is a bit of a sermon in like encouraging others to try to figure out if they have some of these problems. Like really, it might be worth it to have the conversation and put in the effort to to solve some of the past traumas, whatever modality you figure out that works for you. Um, but it's hard to imagine being good at the, a game that will totally exploit any psychological weakness that you have. It will find it and tease it out and just monkey hammer you with it. Um, if you are suffering from acute or less acute trauma. So a little bit of a PSA in this one today. What's the, uh, what's the book called? Uh, the body keeps score. The body uh, keeps score. And that was the interesting thing to me about that was that it, he's actually going into the, like what's happening at a hormone level. Um, actually your like nervous system, like what it's doing. Cause like you're in this constant sense of like a little bit of fear and unknown and like, um, your cortisol levels are always just a little bit elevated. Like your body's always on this alert and it can never sort of reset and get back to a good place where it can then tackle things in a, in the way that you probably need to be able to tackle them. So it's, um, and obviously like, you know, this guy's, he's like measured every single modality that might treat this and like to see like, Oh, well did their cortisol levels change and like a million other, you know, variables of the, the biology of what's happening. Um, even like, I was kind of surprised to read about this, but, um, you can do breathing exercises and there's a bunch of different ones, um, that will like literally change, you know, the amount of nitrogen and nitrous, uh, or nitrous oxide and, uh, like all these other chemicals and in your brain and in your body that will like, like literally change how you interpret information. Um, I mean, it's like, we are just bags of chemicals. And if we can do anything to kind of control them a little bit uh, through our cognitive executive function actions, like we can really give ourselves a huge advantage. So there's like, so when you're, when you're doing those breathing exercises and you're actually, you're, you're physically blowing off these chemicals or whatever you're doing. So, you know, that they, they used to do, you know, they, you used to be able, they, they tell you not to do this. Like if you're going to dive underwater for a long period of time, don't, some people do this. <laughs> blow out all of their carbon dioxide right. and, and it doesn't make you 
better able to swim further. It just takes away the message that goes to your brain that tells you that you need to take a breath. Right. So there are some people who suffer and die from, they, they call it um, shallow water blackouts. And it's, you don't get that signal of carbon dioxide buildup, which is the actual signal. It's never that you're out of oxygen in your body, right? The brain doesn't, it, it never even wants to go to that level, right? There's a margin of safety. Instead, what it senses is carbon dioxide buildup. And if, I guess if you're, if you're free diving and you, you do that kind of hyperventilation exercise and lower your CO2 level in such a way that you can actually like just basically pass out without much warning and it's like game over. So basically what these breathing exercises are doing is they, are, they actually are having some sort of physical, physiological impact on your body. And so that all of the things that people might have been doing through meditation or through other things like that that included some sort of breathing exercise, they have actually been doing something physical and then uh, that's also helped them in sort of in a spiritual or, or, or other sort of way. Yeah. And it's wild. Like um, actually like nitrous oxide is kind of this miracle drug in a way in some of the things that it does. Like, so William James, who's like the father of psychology, um, he like research or uh, historians who study his work, like have like, they break it up into his pre nitrous oxide usage phase and then post and like Winston Churchill, same thing. Like he apparently like found, like went on these vision quests with, with nitrous oxide. And like they used to have nitrous oxide parties where pe like rich people in Britain would just get together and get high on laughing gas and, um, you know, have these sort of epiphanies. And like, I don't know, there's like, there's really weird stuff that's, that happens there. Uh, and it's literally changing your, your brain chemistry when it does that. And what does it, I mean, what, what does it do for you besides sort of, it makes you laugh maniacally or according to the, uh, according to the television shows that I've watched? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to like totally mess up the explanation of this, but like, I think it, it, it deadens certain parts of that are normally connected and that like allows, uh, or maybe it's the other way around and connects things that aren't normally connected and lets you get sort of past that, um, that sense of self that can kind of block you from looking deeper into situations and, and ideas. Uh, Cause you kind of just get hung up on your own. Like the ego is the yeah. obstacle. ego. And even just like your sense of like, Oh, this is me in the situation. I think it takes you outside of it in a way that you can kind of look more objectively as like an outside perspective. Did your author of the book, did he have any, preference for any of those modalities of treatment or did he say it doesn't really matter whichever one sort of works for you uh i think that would be too close to a prescription for us to be giving so i'm okay. gonna i'm gonna punt on that it's it's him saying it isn't it yeah but i nah, that's too close for me i'm not all right the, the, <laughs> the name of the book is the body keeps score for the people who are who are asking in the timeline okay um yeah that's 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 super interesting so the connection to FOMO is just, just connect back to FOMO again for me. Toby, why are you trying to throw me <laughs> sorry, out of the mate, sorry. dickhead? Uh, okay. <laughs> if I'm, if I'm spending all my time worried about how everyone else is doing and it's stressing me out, uh, it is, it is making physiological changes to me right. that are going to lead to me suboptimally doing what I know I can do well. It's one of the it's one of the keys, right, to investing. It's one of the things that makes everybody herd into stuff that's been working. It's that FOMO. You know, cryptos run up, get into crypto. EVs have run up, get into EVs. Options are popping off, get into options. Whatever's sort of working in the moment, for whatever reason, it's the FOMO. We, we think that we can get there too. That makes us run into it, which is sort of almost the entire reason why we underperform. Yep. So it's useful. Yeah, I like it. Billy you frozen there? No. <laughs> Just in, lost in thought. Hey, yeah, uh, I have, I do have one other little thing. This is just a, another little addendum. It's not even really related, but um, you know, we talk a lot about zero sum and and non zero sum kind of thinking, and you know, we're all sort of drawn to that more win win mentality. I think. Hello. <laughs> Can working. anybody hear me? It is yeah, working. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, My bad. <laughs> so this, uh, I saw something recently that uh, I'd never seen anyone do before, but I thought it was kind of worth sharing. 
uh, a friend of mine who runs a small cap activist fund. Uh, and he's like the legit, you know, like he takes 20% of a company, gets on the board, does some real things, not just like, you know, pretends to write letters and all that other stuff. But he, uh, <laughs> he actually, so he, he, if he has an idea that he really likes, you know, he runs a fund and several funds, but he will start a special purpose vehicle, one stock specific SPV and invest in that company with that one only for ones that he really is really into. Is your friend Bill Ackman? <laughs> no. Uh, although, hi, Bill. Thanks for listening. Um, <laughs> he, he, took, uh, he signed an agreement with the CEO of the company that is in the SPV, and he will give him now 30% of the carry that he earns from the SPV to the CEO as a way of sweetening his comp package. Uh, and I've never seen a manager do that before, actually. Like it's always typically come from the corporate level. Uh, but this is sort of one abstraction layer away. Um, and I was like, wow, that's really smart of and it's an interesting I asked, idea. I asked him why did he uh, you know, why set that up that way? And he said, Well, like the company couldn't really go anymore on his comp package the way that it was structured. And I want like skin in the game as much as possible and alignment of incentives. So I'm I'm sharing the economics with him if we do well. Uh, and I was like, wow, that's really smart. I like that. Are you allowed to do it? I guess you're allowed to do it. I mean, who would say you can't get on the same team as your CEO? The SEC. I don't know. I know. The, the rules are a bit, the rules aren't necessarily intuitive. Logical. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the rules don't necessarily create the behavior that you would want. <laughs> I like that approach to the uh, so, so I like the approach to avoiding FOMO because I think that that's one of the challenges. And the way that I the way that I've got around it is just you have to define very clearly the thing that you are that you want to buy. So I I, I just limit my opportunity set to the things that I'm going to do, and that way, if it's outside of that opportunity set, then I just it's just not something that I'm going to do. So I don't necessarily get FOMO. I'd I'd love for my stuff to start working, but I'm happy for everybody else to to work as well you guys got are any you? approaches so say it again <laughs> you're saying are you <laughs> well it's much easier said than done obviously right like it's we're we're such comparative creatures that it's it's tough to the only thing much... that would the only thing that would kill me is if my opportunity set popped off and i missed my opportunity set <sighs> that'd be rough wouldn't it which kind of goes so. back to that is the value rotation over and even if it was, would you, is there any way that you would be able to avoid that? No, no, absolutely not. Right. You're not in that all. boat. Like that's, but that's why I'm reading it. That's why it's, I'm confirming my prize. I know. <laughs> but I'll, I'll hear arguments the other way. Yeah. Give us a mic test. Bill. No, I have nothing to add. Throw in some questions, amigos. We've got about 10 minutes left. Is anybody watching the market through the trading day? Is it is it just uh, you say tech starting to uh, rally again? Yeah, I, I did say that. Somebody had asked a question on the Time Warner or on the Warner and AT and T and Discovery. I don't, I haven't had internet for five days. I don't know. I, <laughs> I I my two cents, not knowing all the specifics, is I think. Um, a more focused AT&T is incrementally negative for all the other people that provide broadband and a more focused big media company is incrementally negative for Netflix and Disney. And then I don't know what the hell you do if you're Comcast. I think they missed the boat and, you know, I guess via common lion skater assets that are out there, but you know, I don't know what those do for people. I, I think that, this is probably one of the last big set of assets that could merge and make a difference. Um, I don't know how to read like Malone giving up control. Uh, some smart people think that that's a really bullish sign. I don't know. I'm more sanguine on that. Why are chip stocks and semiconductors off when there's such a huge shortage? Because yeah, the market knows before there's a shortage. Yeah, so it ran up beforehand. Yeah, Twitter, all these generalists became semi-analysts. That's your clear sign. Usually the top. top. Yeah. yeah. 
I wondered because it's uh, some of the there's some there's some smart takes on Twitter. There's some guys. Yeah, no doubt. But there. like the generalists are not the smart takes. That guy, the mule, he was the smart take. Uh, and there's another guy like, you know, so I, I just think in general, if you're looking at the market and you're saying, well, why is this soft when the data is hard? It's probably because the market's already ahead of what you're thinking. It's probably a good indication. If you're asking that question on a stock you own, it's probably a good indication to sell. What business has fundamentally surprised you the most in the last year, changing your mind on it? Unless you're holding question. for the long term and you don't care, by the way. But then I don't know why you're asking the question. Uh, can you repeat the question? I was stuck on my last answer. And what I'm business has it. fundamentally surprised you the most in the last year, changing your mind on it? I think that's a great question. I probably need a little bit of time to think about it. But changing your mind on it is the hard part. Yeah. Not going to do that. Hmm. Bullish yeah. or bearish? Go Which on. way did you go? <laughs> Oh, I think Peloton's a much, much better business than people give it credit for. And I think that people get hung up on the valuation and miss what's going on in front of them. What's going on in front of them? It's an incredible product. It's, a, I mean, absolutely rabid fans. Uh, they're building out uh, additional things in the app. I think people get hung up on the bike cost and they're missing the forest from the trees. Uh, it's a subscription business. Could it all crumble? Yeah, but I... I think it's much much stronger than people just saying like oh this is just going to go away the iphone was just going to go away too nokia was going to kill it like i don't believe that peloton just goes away now is it worth 28 billion dollars i don't know you know reasonable minds can differ on that question but this brand is very very real and the business model is very real i would say i'd probably answer uh the growth rates on the big tech companies just the sheer volume size of them have been surprising to me. Um, I just yeah. would have, I would just never would have thought that you could put up that kind of number with, already from such a large base. So kudos to them. Yeah, that's right. Particularly Amazon, 47% on a $100 billion base. Wow. Yeah. I mean, imagine going through a pandemic without modern tech. Sounds Impossible. peaceful. Peaceful. <laughs> oh, I think it would have been awful. Sounds like equanimity. It sounds like economic collapse to me. Yeah, I'm, uh, being, I'm being a little glib, but yeah. Does value do worse in a market crash? I saw an interesting interview with Ross Yarrow that made me question a lot of my value assumptions. So my observation there is that uh, people who think that value seems to do better through a crash are typically talking about 2000 to 2002, but the scenario the circumstances were unusual in the sense that it had underperformed in the run up to that point. And then uh, it, it also, seemed to starting business quality was, and the business quality was higher. Yeah. That, that's a, there's some cliff assness AQR research that shows that the, the return on assets was better in the value bucket where typically you get a little discount. You, you get, you get a slightly worse quality portfolio but you get a bigger discount and it's you sort of relying on the discount for it to work but my observation is that when you get a proper drawdown uh when when the market goes down value sort of goes down alongside it if anything value sells off first value falls as much as the market does and then uh it seems to recover first and so sometimes i think it's just a t it's like a measurement timing issue where that you look at the year in which the crash occurred and it looks like value did better, but it's because value has just bounced earlier than the rest of the market. So I don't know that you can necessarily hide out. The only thing that I would say, like just ignoring the value, but looking at the quality of the business, looking at the quality of the balance sheet does seem to be a better way of working out what's going to do better through a crash. Because if you have a company that's maintains its cash flow through the crash and it's able to take advantage of the fact that its shares are undervalued, and they have management who's aware of that and willing to do it, and they buy back a lot of stock. Then it's like a one in a hundred <laughs> companies that are yeah, that. There's, there's not many that kind but, of foresight. But at least you get that bid through. Uh, yeah, you know the company is buying it back, and the company is becoming that more, much more valuable through that period. You want that kind of industrialist CEO. I do think there's some argument to be made for the how far away are cash flows and. You know, in a, if rates go up at all, 
like the closer the cash flow is to today, the less of the hit that it is um, when you, as opposed to if the cash flow is projected in the story, you know, 20 years from now, why they're going to make so much money. Well, you raise the rate on a 20 year out, boy, that, that pile of money gets a hell of a lot smaller. So if you, if your version of value is sort of cash today versus cash tomorrow, um, I, I think there is a little bit of an argument to be made that like that theoretically shouldn't get beat up as much um, if you were to have a reassessment of really like how much hy- hyperbolic discounting is there of cash flow. The only the only thing that I would say to that is that that just it seems to be when when you get a proper sell off the the, co- the correlations go to one everything just sort of seems to sell off together because there's these weird cross connections underneath that you can't see someone's selling their least worst position because they need to fund something else somewhere else. But, uh, yeah. I was I'm always struck by how weird it is the way that strategies change tr- sort of trade together. You know, one basically inversely correlated to arc and I, there's no reason why in, in you some of my strategies that i should be but it just happens to be that way yeah that is and that i don't like does it feel like that that is a bigger part of things now too and if it, i don't know if it's like etfs or uh, indexing or balances or something but there's feels like there's something structural where that that's a bigger thing now where like everything moves together this sort of like Teeter totter kind of a feeling. I don't know if it's in. I don't know is the answer because uh, that feels that feels true. I just don't know. I've never seen any data in that r- regard. And I think that there's you know Michael Green's got the flows argument where he says that the big index, the big market capitalization weighted index, you know S and P five hundred that that start Russell that those style of companies because they get the flows then they weight disproportionately into these companies, and so that's why they sort of seem to behave in a way that isn't necessarily tied to fundamentals. It's tied to when the flows come in, when the flows go out. But then there's thematic ETFs underneath there. I just don't know if they're big enough to kind of push the, the market around. Although ARC certainly is relative to its investee it, 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 companies. Pieces, yeah. Yeah. But it's active, so they don't necessarily have to trade in according to any existing rule. They don't have to trade in in size. They can trade in according to what they think is the most undervalued or the best opportunity, however they're doing it. Did we talk about per Brian Munger buying Alibaba? Have we already done that? No. Do you guys have any, th- do you guys have any thoughts on that one? He did. <laughs> it happened. Can confirm. Happened. Moving, <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it's not like a huge secret that they both speak to Lee Lu, right? So it's probably Lee Lu's idea. Lilu seems reasonably smart. They seem reasonably smart. I think there's probably worse things to buy. I don't have a good sense of the quality of the accounting. I suspect Charlie may have outsourced that a little bit. So I don't know. I mean, that's the, that's the, <laughs> I got Mike Mitchell in the comments. He wants to know what this has to do with the lumber market. Good question, Mike. <laughs> Not much, Mike. Sorry. It's, like uh, I was it's, thinking about you when I said that uh, near-term cash flow idea, actually. Yeah, I mean, and to be fair, I talked about uh, commodity companies at Rabadi. So, Mike, you got your piece today. <laughs> Resident home shopping aficionado and lumber sexual, <laughs> Mike Mitchell. <laughs> uh, Welcome, Mike. Um, no, no. I think I think it's funny. The thing about Alibaba that I think is funny is that I, I find that the financial statement, it's really hard to read. I find, I find it just, I can't figure it out what's going on there. There are too many subs and things for me. So I just pass on it. But there are, and there are some good websites out there where people do deep dives and they, they don't necessarily like what they find either. You can find those websites. So I, I think it's funny when, when Munga buys it and then uh, Lilu, you know, two very, very smart guys, very, very good investors. But then I just feel like there's a lot of follow on from that. It's popped up in a lot of 13S since they've sort of come out with it. Let me throw a counter at you. If you're a website and you throw out this big negative Alibaba write-up, if that's right, you're a hero. And if it's wrong, it doesn't matter. It's just some random article you wrote on the internet. So I tend to put more, like if somebody was like, I'm short in size and this is why I'd listen to that person. If you're just writing something on the blog 
I'd rather listen to people with money on the line. That's fair. I just think that the 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 shorts tend to do I'm a just lot saying. more work. And uh, you, you know, the shorts really the 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 ones the site that I'm thinking of is dedicated to uh, to Alibaba, and they they're not they just point out a lot of things. That's okay. it's not like they're not arguing that, and it's been around for a long time. That site's been around for a long time. I just the name of it escapes me at the moment, but. There's yeah, some no, if reasonable... they got money on the line, then I'd listen. I mean, I don't know. They may. Speaking of someone who's got money on the line, Barry, we didn't talk about his short on Tesla and we're just about out of time. <laughs> Next time. He's mm-hmm. probably going to get killed on it. You think so? Yes, it's a widow maker. People have been short that thing forever. He might make it. I hope he does. I he's, like Mike Burry. I root for Mike Burry. Mike yeah. Burry and I made money together on Curate. Shout out to you, Mike. But that's it for this week, folks. Thanks so much. We'll, uh, we'll catch you next time. Oh, hang on. Let me let me not do it that way.